grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. It's been a long couple of weeks. A couple weeks ago, Kathy and I had the privilege of being in Vacation Bible School with all of the children that came. Almost 70 children were here. And uh, Sean had asked us uh, if we would be willing to lead a group around. And little Emerson, I see two of them are here today. Uh, we did that, and it was great. It was exhausting, but it was good. Near the end of the week, because we had our two granddaughters with us, Claire and Vivian, who were 11 and 9, and they got to go to vacation Bible school. Claire as a helper, and Vivian in class. Well, near the end of the week, for about the last three days, Claire wasn't feeling too well. She had a temperature, so Kathy decided it was best if she stay home with Claire. And so I was here with my gang for the whole week, and uh, I had a good time, but I gotta admit, at the end of that week, I was physically exhausted. I was worn out, spiritually filled, but exhausted. Then, when Vacation Bible School came to a close on Friday, our car was packed up. We headed off to the Catskills because every year, our family gets together for family reunion, 14 of us. Our children and grandchildren from Portland, Oregon, Louisville, Kentucky, Scarsdale, New York, and us, and we get together. And that was right after Vacation Bible School. And we hiked and we had played games. We just had a wonderful time. The kids stayed up later than they should. And so it was a long day and a long evening. Well, that was all over yesterday. And we started driving home. And we got home last night. And so if I fall asleep, please understand, <laughs> you know, but it's been wonderful, but I guess as I get older, you know, I seem to wear out a lot more, and I, I look forward to lunch every day, because right after lunch, I like to take that 20-minute nap, and Kathy will wake me up two hours later. <laughs> but anyhow, I go back, and to see all your wonderful faces, new friends and members that I met this morning, people from the community, you know, it, it's just interesting. So for those six months that we were gone from you all, I was filling a vacancy at a Lutheran Church Redeemer in Stewart, Florida, where we have a condo. Every year, my goal when going to Florida, usually January through April, is to get a tan. I did not get a tan. I was filling a vacancy at a church there near the end of February all the way through, and it was February, March, April, May, and on June 30th, preached my last message, and whoosh, we came back, then vacation Bible school, then family vacation. Dear friends, next week I hope I have nothing to do, but I'm sure Kathy has a list. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, as a, well, the emeritus, the retired pastor here, I am so thrilled to be back and to see so many familiar faces and new faces too. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we can handle life's shortages, because that happens in our life. So up here on the board... Uh, I've got the part of our scripture lesson I just read for you a little while ago, and I want to invite you to read that scripture along with me from Mark chapter 6. Let's read verses 41 and 2 together. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and broke the loaves and gave them set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and they all ate and we're satisfied. Thus far, our text. Now, I want you to picture what is going on here. Jesus had been, prior to this, he had been teaching all day and healing the sick and just ministering to a large group of people. By the end of the, pretty much the day, he was tired. And so the disciples also were coming back and telling Jesus about all the things and miracles that had happened because he had sent them out to do ministry after spending many years with them, training them. They didn't know what they were going to do, but God said, I'm going to bless you. You're going to preach the word. You're going to minister. You know, you're going to heal people. You're just, it's going to be marvelous. And so they went out kind of scared, but they went out in the power of the Holy Spirit. When they came back, they had so much to tell Jesus, and he was exhausting. So he finally said, guys, my language, guys, let's get out of here, and let's go away to a solitary, a remote place. We all need to get some rest. And so they left the crowd, got into a boat, and started going to the other side. Well, the people saw where they were going. Some got in boats and followed. Others were running over there. So by the time Jesus and the disciples got there to the other side, they got out. 
Jesus looked at this multitude of people that he had just got done talking to before. They wanted more. They wanted to hear more about God's grace and goodness and forgiveness, love and mercy, you know. And he looked at them and the scripture said he had compassion on them. He felt that their need was so great that his heavenly father, our heavenly father, would give him the strength and the ability to continue teaching and preaching God's word to encourage them. He looked at them and realized he was their shepherd. Now, in our Old Testament reading that Christy shared with us this morning, there were shepherds of God's people in Israel that were not being faithful. They were there for their own gain. And God said in his word, I'm going to get rid of those shepherds, and I, God, myself, I'm going to gather my people together, and I'm going to take care of them. And, of course, we know the whole Old Testament was talking about the Messiah, the anointed one coming, and, of course, we've come to know in God's word, it was Jesus. It is Jesus. And so here was Jesus looking at all of these people, hungering and thirsting to hear the word of God. And he had compassion. He wanted to take care of them. He wanted to make sure their needs were getting met. And so picture a large crowd, okay? A large crowd, a remote location, and it was late in the day. They had nothing to eat. Scripture tells us there was 5,000 men. Because in Jesus' time, men were the ones being counted, but there were also a lot of women and children that also followed along. There was probably a crowd there, close to 10,000 people, just massed all together. And so late in the day, Jesus' disciples are there, and, you know, Jesus is tired, they're tired, and the disciples come up to him and say, you know, we need to send these people away to, to get some food, you know, it's late. They didn't bring anything with them. And Jesus said these remarkable words to them. He says, you feed them to the 12 disciples. And they're looking at each other and saying, what? Here's our lesson for today. I want to share with you biblical principles for handling life's shortages. The first one is this. Think about this. When opportunity for a miracle occurs, it occurs at a time when we just simply do what God has asked us to do and trust in him when we don't seem to have the ability. But the first thing you and I need to do in our lives is we need to accept responsibility. You give them something to eat. We have to accept responsibility for our own actions, the way we think and what we do. When something happens, we should not procrastinate, you know, and put off what needs to be done. We need to do it now. I know when Kathy gives me a list, I'm using Kathy, you in my sermon. Right, Kathy, there she is right there. I remember one time, and I may not be remembering it rightly, but Kathy had given me a number of things that she asked me if I could get done. And I felt so good that I got the things on the list done by the time she came home. And I said, all done. And then I think I remember saying, but did you turn the list over on the other side? <laughs> At any rate, sometimes when we are, have responsibilities, sometimes we procrastinate, don't we? We kind of put it off the next day. I know, Kath, when I get home, I am going to change the water filter today. Okay. So we procrastinate. We put off things we need to be done. And so that in Mark 6 says, it's late in the day. Here we are. People are hungry. What should we be doing? And Jesus simply told the disciples, you're my disciples. You take care of them. Secondly, sometimes, don't we, when we have situations in life, we ignore the problem? The disciples' solution. Well, Lord, why don't you send the people away and let them go into the town and buy something to eat to take care of themselves? Okay. Sometimes we do that, don't we, also? We try and give the responsibility to somebody else by ignoring the problem. Well, that's not my, as my little daughter would say when she was three, not my responsibility. So we put it off. We, pro we procrastinate. We ignore the problem. But Jesus said, I want you, part of the congregation, my disciples, I want you to take care of all these people. Overwhelming. I want you, in a sense, he was saying, I want you to be shepherds to them. Find out what their need is. Take care of that need. And thirdly, sometimes 
You know, when we talk about handling life shortages, we make excuses, okay? Um, disciple said, Lord, this would be eight months wages. Now, back in Jesus' time, a denarius, one denarius was a day's wage. We accumulate, uh, count that today, let's say a day's wage, about $50 a day. Well, if you add all of that up, what Jesus was saying is there's about $12,000 in our money that was needed. The disciples, you know, Judas looks into the purse and says, I don't think we have enough money even to feed a few people. And so what are they going to do? Secondly, when we talk about how do we handle our life shortages, you know, second thing we should do is we, after we accept responsibility, I've got to do something, get it done. We assess the resources. And so Jesus said, go out and find out what do we have available? What has people brought with them? So they go throughout the whole crowd and they come up with a little boy and they bring it up. That little boy's mother was smart. He made sure that her child who was going to go out for a long day took along, you know, some food. Five small barley loaves and two fish. A barley loaf was a the beggar's bread. It was a working man's bread, a humble bread that you would take with you during the day. And so they brought this little boy and his lunch up to Jesus and said, this is what we've got. And he thought to themselves, what good is all that? How can it feed so many people? And Jesus said, take the crowd and have them sit down in groups of 50 and 100. Now you begin to get this concept of going back to the Old Testament when Jethro came to Moses and Moses was handling all the problems of the people and Jethro said, you gotta kill yourself. You need to spread it out. You need to get some of the other men, the leaders from the tribes of Israel and put them in different groups, size groups and let those men shepherd those people. Well, it's like a congregation today. We have a pastor, a pastor who comes to shepherd the flock. You are Pastor Jim's flock here. He is our pastor. And so he provides God's word and sacrament and ministry and care for us. And likewise, then, enables us to start caring for each other. That's why you have those cards in your pew rack there about prayers. You have a concern, put in our prayers. As we were praying about them for today, and Neil prayed the prayers for us, we have concern for one another. We have a food pantry. We have opportunity through our Vacation Bible School and other ministries, our Little Lambs Preschool, to reach out into the community and to do what is best for the community by sharing the love of Christ among them. And so, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they come up with it. Realistically, evaluate your resources. So take a moment right now. Just kind of think about your own life and your own family and things that you have. Do you have all that you need? Do you have bills? <laughs> How do we get those bills? Do we have mortgages? Do we have car payments? Do we have other payments that we make? So we take a look at all that we have, all that God has enabled us to accumulate. We also are realistic and take a look at our resources, our finances, and how we're going to meet all that. But think about it this way. The Apostle Paul said the three things we need the most are food, clothing, and shelter. Do you all have that? Yeah, we all do, don't we? In fact, we probably have more than we need in life, but you all, God always makes sure that through our gifts and abilities enables us to acquire exactly what we need. And all the other stuff that we have, we enjoy it, and sometimes we get rid of some stuff that we don't need. Sometimes we see other people in need, and we say, well, I've got too much of that. I can give to others. I can go to Luther Mission Society up in Annapolis and other places, and I can take good clothing and other things. I can give away. I don't really need that much because we can't take it with us. Everything that we have, think about it right now in our life, when God calls us home, we go home to be with the Lord, you're not taking anything with you except one thing, your faith, your hope, your love in Christ. So all that we have and all that we've gained, right now, we attempt to do something good with it to benefit not only our family ourselves, but to also share it with other people. So ask yourself this question. 
What do I have? How has God blessed me that I've acquired all this and I'm responsible for it? And secondly, what can I do with what I have? How can I use what I have, have material, spiritual, physical, all the stuff, how can I use that to bless other people? And here's the third point. Give God first place. It took me many years in my life, growing up in a Christian family, as a Christian, to come to the realization that God was not the most important person in my life. I had been living for self and not Savior. So there I was at 21 years old, sitting on a bench outside of Concordia Seminary and struggling through 12 years of school and four years of college with a 2.1 average. If I ever got an A and a B on a report card, my family would have had a block party. I was an average student. I didn't study that well. I grew up in a blue collar family. But it was at that point, after struggling for four years and praying and asking God to help me get through Greek and Hebrew and German and Latin, English. And finally I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I said, I just can't, I'm exhausted. So today, I'm making a commitment. I'm going to make you, Lord, the Lord of my life. Not just my savior, because I had a faith, I believed in Christ, I knew the word of God, I studied it. I believed all that, but I was, I was in control of my life. And God says, uh-uh, first commandment, you should have no other gods. Because at that point in my life, my car was important. Kathy was first important. Well, I didn't meet her until then. Like, she was second. But in meeting Kathy, it helped me to understand that, you know, God's got to be number one in my life. She's God number one in her life. Making God first, not just one time, but all the time. After that commitment, God began to grow stronger in me and realizing putting God first in my time, my talents, my spiritual gifts, my treasures, I actually graduated from seminary with a 3.25. Kathy thinks it was because I married her, and I agree. <laughs> she taught me how to study. But dear friends, that's it. That's the first commandment. Shove no other gods. Those first three commandments dealing with us and our relationship with the Lord, the other seven deal with us and our relationship with others. So if you were that little boy in that crowd, would you give up your lunch for everybody else? That little kid had a lot of faith. He believed that God was going to do something great. He was listening to the words of Jesus out of the mouths of children. So Jesus took the boy's gift. He blessed it. He broke it. He multiplied it, and he distributed it among the people. Never underestimate what God can do through ordinary people who make ordinary and amazing sacrifices. All right, let's bring this to closure here. Giving that can spark a miracle. Here it is. When something out of the ordinary becomes a reality, that's a miracle. Here's three points. Number one, God encourages us through his word to give sacrificially. The boy gave all he had willingly. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. We give because God has given to us. It's not the amount that's important. It's the sacrifice. It's to say is, I've got more than enough, and rather than storing it away or digging it in a hole or put, putting it in a bank, what can I do to take that and advance God's kingdom? What can I do to give in such a way that more people will hear God's word all over the world? And there's so many things out there to do. So giving sacrificially means I see a need, I can do something about it. I see a need in my congregation, my fellowship of believers, or somebody in need. I'm not going to pray for them. I'm going to make sure they've got food. I'm going to make sure they've got transportation. I'm going to make sure that I give sacrificially of my finances to enable the church to go out and to continue what it's supposed to do, to joyfully proclaim God's word and enthusiastically share Christ's love. Secondly, by giving faithfully, God can't use 
what we hold back. He will not bless what we hold back if we just are storing it away and not letting it do any good. Because as I said earlier, when God calls us home, you can't take it with you. So we need to use what we have now to bless other people. Luke 6, 38. Jesus said, give, it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be the measure given back to you. The first call that Kathy and I had in ministry in 1973 was to go start a church from scratch. No land, no people, no place to live, and I got paid and had a month's vacation. I thought that was a great job. But I learned a lot from that farm community. I was a city boy. I learned all about farming. This is one thing I learned. You plant two bushels of wheat, you get 67 bushels back. What are the principles? First, you must plant a seed to get a crop. You give something away to get something back, the harvest. Secondly, you always reap more than you sow. You get more out of what life than what you put into it. And the third principle is you reap on a different day. It's called time delay. More than you sow. It's a principle of multiplication. We may not see all of the things that God enables us to accomplish by doing for others. But in the end, those who are blessed realize where it came from and what it did. They want to be a blessing to others as well. Here's a quick story. A group of people in an airplane getting ready to take off. They had landed. Now the plane was going to go on to its next destination. And the pilot comes on the line and says, folks, we are going to be delayed a little bit because we're still waiting for the snack truck to arrive to fill the snacks. They waited for five minutes, ten minutes. Finally, the pilot came back and said, look, I know you people want to be on time. You've got to get to your airport on time. We're going to take off without the snacks. We're just going to take off and go. Well, they did, and people started grumbling and complaining. They say, what is this? I paid for a first-class ticket. I'm getting nothing. And all the other people started saying, I want something to drink. I want something to eat. And it was terrible going on. All of a sudden, I'm going to sue this one. When I get off this plane, I'll never fly this airline again. The stewardess walks down, a flight attendant. She stands in the middle of the plane, and she says, good afternoon, people. I know that you're upset. I think we all would have enjoyed having those snacks together, but let's think about it for a moment. Some of you are on this plane, we're on the first flight, we landed, we took off. I know you didn't eat all the snacks that you got. How about sharing what you do have? Maybe something you brought on board for our new passengers that you got for a snack. How about taking some of that and sharing with the people in your row? Oh, some of you brought on something to read or a newspaper. Why don't you talk about that with your people sitting around you? You probably are a grandparent and you've got lots of pictures on your phone or pictures in your wallet. Why don't you share that? Why don't you begin talking with one another? Get to know your people around you a little bit and encourage one another. Before you know it, within a matter of moments, things quieted down and all of a sudden people were smiling and people were laughing and people were getting along with each other. The plane landed on time and everybody got off. They were happy. Isn't that what Jesus did with that crowd of people there? He gave them the first thing they really needed. He gave them encouragement from the word of God and taught them to put all the pieces together about who the Messiah really was and who Jesus really was when they saw the miracles and heard his words. Boy, he, he preaches with son has authority, not like our religious leaders are doing. And isn't that really the way it should be among us as well? Dear friends, giving cheerfully. Giving is not a debt I owe, but it's a gift I sow. 2 Corinthians 9. Each one of us should give, not grudgingly or because we are made to do so. God loves cheerful givers. Then there is no limit to the blessings God can send you. He will make sure that you always have all that you need for yourselves. Finally, expect the harvest. You never know when you say a kind word, you give to somebody in need, you do something, you have no idea what's going to happen in that person's life, how it's going to bless them to be a blessing. It's called paying it forward. But we simply do what God's Spirit motivates us to do out of love for God. We see a need and we say, I can do that. I could help the 
preschool get ready for the next year. And by the way, the school is filled for next year with a waiting list, our Little Lambs Preschool. That's what I read in our newsletter. And some of the equipment needs repairs, some to be clean. There's a list of things. And you can look at just one little thing and say, I can do that. And with every one of us here, God's work will get done. You see, in the book of Ephesians and Acts, it talks about when people came together, God brought all the people together, each one with different gifts and abilities. So if everyone does their own part, the whole job gets done. And we may not be a large congregation. We're a small congregation, but we are a family, and we care about one another. So here's the lesson. When there is a need sensed by a few, and each individual accepts his or her responsibility to do what they can with what they have, God works a miracle. Because with God, all things are possible. That's the kind of giving that sparks a miracle. That's by seeing not what we don't have, but what God has given us that we do have and what we can do with his blessing. Amen? And may the amazing grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the boundless love of God the Father for each one of you, and the immediate peace, power, and joy of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.